All right. So why don't you guys go ahead and turn over to Mark 1, 14. While you guys are doing that, I'm just going to briefly go over what we're in the middle of. We just started a series last week called Holy Dust. Man, did Dr. E not do a phenomenal job? He's such a good teacher. I, Nathan and I were just like, man, he's such a good teacher. I, I loved it because what he was teaching on is that God sends us warning signs, right, of when we're about to go over a cliff. He's like, hold up, wait, slow down. I loved his little construction vest, too. That was, a, that was exciting. But his, his whole message was so applicable to my life in the moment, and we'll talk about that soon. But he just did a phenomenal job. And so we just started this series called Holy Dust. So it's based off of the Jewish tradition that a disciple should follow his rabbi so close that the dust from his feet kick up on their clothing. And see, as Christ followers, that's where we should be, shouldn't we? That we're following Jesus Christ so close that everything that he does, that everything that he is, His love, his compassion, his patience, his kindness, the way that he interacts with people, the way that he interacts with the crazies, the way that he interacts with the people that are broken, the way that he does things, the way that he faces controversial issues, all of those things should be kicking up upon us and become part of what we're clothed in, right? And so if we want to follow Jesus closely... And, and we want to be more like him, then, then what does that look like? Well, first off, it takes grace, right? We can't do anything. We're saved by grace through faith, and we walk that salvation out by grace through faith. So God, give me the grace. But our part in that is once we ask for the grace, then, then we have to know him in order to be like him, don't we? How can we be like something if we don't know what they do or how they react or, or any of those things? We, we can't be like something we don't know. So how do we know somebody? I think about my husband. We've been married 19 years. I know him. I know what angers him. Sometimes that's not a good thing. <laughs> Although I still like it. I know what makes him happy. I, I know how he interacts with people. I know how he is loving and compassionate, and he sits and he listens. How do I know this? From years of spending time with him and studying him. Not in a creepy way. (laughs) But just watching him. Watching him interact with our children. Watching him interact with people out in public. Watching him interact with the crazies, with controversial issues, with these kinds of things. I I spend time with him and I study him. How do we know Jesus? We spend time with him and we study him. We spend time with him and we study him. And that's what this series is about. See, because Mark's gospel is more about what Jesus does and less about what he says. And so we pray that we all have a revelation of who Jesus is so that we can walk humbly in the footsteps behind him. All right, Mark 1.14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. All right, so we see there's a transition here, don't we? John the Baptist, that's the John, not John the disciple, but John the Baptist is put in prison. Now, who was he? He was the forerunner for Jesus. He went ahead of Jesus, and he prepared the way for Jesus to come on scene and start his public ministry. And so John preached to the people. He taught the people. He actually had disciples. They were John the Baptist's disciples. And and so here we see where an era has come to an end. John is put in prison, and we'll read later where he's beheaded, where he's, he's gone, he's out of the picture. But he's put in prison, and then who comes on scene? Jesus Christ. Now what we need to realize is Jesus has been approved by the Father, tested in the wilderness, which he passed the test, just if you haven't read it, 
And now he's starting his public ministry. And so John prepared the people, and Jesus comes in and says, hey, John told you you need forgiveness. John told you this is how you need to live. This is what's going to happen. And Jesus there is, was there literally to show them, to walk that out for them. Verse 16, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, at once, at once they left their nets and followed him. Not, oh, after a couple of days of prayer, God, is this really you? Do you really want me to give up everything? I need five signs to know that this is you, God. No, at once. Jesus said, come and follow me. And at once, they left everything and they followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed them. So there was, there was a family business. And, and, and they had to leave their father in the boat and yes, he had hired hands, but back then, family businesses were family businesses. You stayed in that. You didn't just up and leave. That wasn't okay, but they said, okay, Jesus is calling us out. We're going to follow him. He is our rabbi. He is our Messiah. He is our teacher. Now, before I go on a rant about that, we need to realize something here, church. See, Mark is a very short and to-the-point gospel. There's not a lot of details, which I love. I don't like details. When we're buying a car, I tell my husband, year, make, model, price. And he's like, well, the intake and this and that. I'm like, year, make, model, price. So I love this. I love this very short and to the point, right? But then there's more to it that we need to read outside of the book of Mark. This is where we study. We don't want you to just come in here and listen to a sermon and go home and be like, oh, praise the Lord, that was great. Oh, Damon was funny or Carrie was crazy or whatever. No, we want you to go home. We want you to study. We want you to pull these scriptures up and do some research. Go deeper. That's what God is asking us to do in this so that we can know the truth because the truth will. Amen. And so when we look outside of just the book of Mark, we see that there's so much more that's gone on. And not that Mark is bad. It's not. It's very good. I'm not bashing Mark's gospel. It's a very amazing book, and that's why we're going through it. But there are other things that we see when we look outside of this gospel, when we look in Matthew, Luke, and John, when we begin to see the Bible is one big story and not different sections. And what we realize when we read and we study is that this was not their first encounter with Jesus. Reading it, it seems like it, doesn't it? It's like Jesus is like, hey guys, by the way, I'm the Messiah, drop everything, follow me. They're like, okay. No, this was not their first encounter with Jesus. They were John's disciples. John had pointed out the Messiah. They knew who Jesus was, is. They actually followed him. Some of them spent time with them. Did you know that before this, Jesus had changed Simon's name to Peter? So a lot has happened. And see, I just want to sit on this for a minute because I think sometimes we go out in the world and we're asking people to give up everything that they know and they haven't even had an encounter with Jesus. We're asking them to act like Jesus when they don't even know him. So they have this encounter with Jesus and they know that he's the Messiah. They know that he is the savior that they have been waiting for, that their people have been praying for for years. And in that relationship with them, they're willing to say, okay, I'm going to give it up. God asked them to physically leave everything that they knew, their occupation, their families, their source of income, everything that they were physically walking away from that. I don't think it's ironic that you guys are here today. You're doing that thing. 
There are times that God asks us to physically walk away from everything. I had that happen when I first gave my life to Jesus. I was holding on to my job. I loved my I was a workaholic. And God asked me to leave that, to physically leave that, right? There are times, missionaries, we see it all the time, asked to leave their country, everything they know. But it's not always the case, is it? It's not always that God is asking us to physically get up and leave, wow, get up and leave everything, is it? So, so what does that look like? If God's not telling me to, to get up and leave preaching, let's just use this as an example. If he's not saying, Carrie, I don't want you to walk away from it, what does that look like to give it up but still do it? Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. We're talking about being disciples, right? We're talking about following Jesus close behind, being more like him, being more Christ-like. And so we read this and we're like, wait a second, this was Jesus talking. Wait a second, he's saying to hate your mom and dad, but he tells us to love. This is where studying comes in contradicts what Jesus says elsewhere in the Bible, doesn't it? So when we break it down and we begin to study it, we see that that word hate doesn't mean what we think it means. It's actually the word missio, which means to love less than. So let's plug that back in. If anyone comes to me and does not love their father less than me, love their mother less than me, love their wife less than me, love their children less than me, love their job less than me, love their cars less than, than me, loves their gifts and their talents and, and their, their hobbies and their, the things that they do on the weekends and their addictions and their appearance. If they don't love those things less than me, then they're really not a disciple. See, it's not that God is always asking us to physically walk away from these things, it's that he wants our heart in them. But I think it's hard for us sometimes, isn't it? I guarantee you, every single person in here has something. Because we live in a fallen world. It's not a guilt thing. It's just how it is. The enemy doesn't want us to let God be God in our life. So he finds that thing that God gave you as a gift that you enjoy, that you have a passion with. Maybe you, you enjoy a relationship or, uh, or your spouse. I hope you enjoy your spouse. I enjoy mine. Um, whatever it is, he put that in you. He gave that to you as a gift, but the enemy wants to use that against him because Satan is mean. He does not like us. He does not want us to keep God as God in our life. And so we have to be willing to let go of these things. Because when we don't, we're essentially letting them be God in our life. We're letting them take over his place. We're saying, God, uh, uh, you're good, and, and I'll call you when I need you, but you know what? I'm going to listen to this over you. And that breaks his heart. The things that we put our trust in are ridiculous, aren't they? The things that we rely on are ridiculous, aren't they? The things that we get so caught up in and our whole world becomes a part, those things aren't going to be there for you when you're hurting. They're not going to be there whenever you're falling apart. They didn't die for you. They don't care. This is the world, guys. Man, I did not want to share this story, and I am avoiding it, but here it goes. <laughs> Who was here for my incline story? Okay, we got another one, guys. Not proud of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> a, a few months back, I just, I love working out. I told you guys that with the incline. I just love it. I love working out, and um, so I started this group. We're called the Misfits. Get it? Misfit. 
I love it, Miss Fit. Okay, I think it's great. I love it. So we start a group. We have the T-shirts. We have the group me. We're like going to the gym at 5:30 in the morning. We're like working out together, praising God. It's so great, right? In that, I got a little obsessed. I become like this drill sergeant. I'm sorry, Ashley. <laughs> I become like this drill sergeant, right? I just am like, oh, we gotta work out. You can't ever miss. It doesn't matter. Da, 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 da. And, and I don't know why. I'm like, God, why do I do the things I don't wanna do? And I don't do the things I want to do. God, give me grace, right? And so I've had this struggle this whole time of like staying focused on God and still working out and still helping these ladies and still doing these things. I like to write the workouts for us. Like I'm, I'm very into it. I love fitness, I love health, I love supplements and eating healthy, you know, all this stuff and all of that is good. It's not bad, right? But then I became so focused on that that, that this thing happened where God just kind of got pushed down. And you know, go at 5.30, work out, go home, get the kids ready, get them fed, take them to school, come home, and then that's what I call my God time. Well, the God time was God time, but it became more like, okay, I'll read my devotional, and have you, have you been there? You're just kind of like, okay, let's get this done because I need to clean my house, or I need to go do this, or I need to go do that. And, and, it, and, and I noticed in the last couple of weeks, I've just not been present with God as much. Some, yes, but not a lot. So anyway, so Nathan and I, as you guys, a lot of you know, we took our daughter, Michaela, up to Port Angeles and um, dropped her off there. It was very emotional, very sad. I like my daughter. I, I found out this in the process. <laughs> so all you parents that are questioning that, just hold on until they have to leave. <laughs> You'll find out you actually like them. Um, so anyway, we go up there to take them. It was very emotional, exhausted. I preached up there. And so just, you know, we were worn out. And so my wise husband, on Tuesday, he's like, well, after we got back, we got back late Monday night, Tuesday, he's like, babe, I really think we shouldn't work out this week. And I'm like, I don't, what's wrong with him? Why is he trying to not work out? I mean, I don't even know what he's thinking. Holy Spirit, speaking through him, are you hearing me? I knew. I knew. Just like the incline. I knew. I was like, well, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Well, that's the worst that can happen. I'm a little tired. So anyway, so go work out Wednesday. I go and work out Thursday and end up hurting myself. This time it was not my knee. It was my bum. <laughs> that is humbling. When God brings you back to that place where you're like, God, I don't ever want to put anything above you. Knock me on my butt if I ever do. He did. <laughs> I actually thought I broke my tailbone there for a minute because I would broken it before. So praise the Lord. I'm okay. I'm walking. Amen. Amen. But anyway, the point is, is that Friday night, because I, I didn't, let me just say this too. Thursday, I got hurt. Friday, I show up to work out, and I told the ladies, I'm not going to tell my husband that I hurt myself because he won't want me to come. I mean, come on. When you're doing that, it's obviously there's something there, right? And so... I call him after the gym on Friday. I'm like, I think I hurt myself. Friday night, I was in so much pain. I couldn't even sleep. I was just like, oh my gosh, God, what did I do? What did I do? Am I ever going to be able to walk again? What is happening? And that night, this is for someone here. That night, I had this conversation with the Lord, you know, where he's speaking to your spirit. And I'm just like, God, I don't even like this, like what, I, I want you to like fix this, to heal this, right? Because I was desperate. And in that moment, God showed me something. He showed me how there's times that my kids are in trouble and they're hurting. But as a mom, it would be really bad if I went in and rescued them. And so as a mom, instead, what I do is I go in and I sit with them and I walk with them and I teach them in that moment. And I'm there crying with them as they're hurting. I take that pain on myself. And in that moment, God was showing me that he was grieving with me, not just because of my physical pain, but the pain of realizing what I had done. How I had put working out above him again. And how I was feeling so bad about it. But there's no condemnation in Christ. 
And so I had to get to that place where I said, okay, God, what, what do I do with this? Okay, so we're going to walk through the pain. Hopefully I get healed someday. Hopefully I'm okay and I can go back to the gym. But I still hadn't completely learned my lesson because the next morning I got up and said, I hope I'm better by Monday so I can go work out. And so I spent some time with God on Saturday and I was sitting there and I was just, you know, I just kind of chill with God sometimes. Just like, Lord, I don't even know what's wrong with me. And he said, Carrie, again to my spirit, I didn't hear him audibly. Carrie, I want you to be as relentless at pursuing me as you are at pursuing the gym. I was like, dang. So I said, okay, what does that look like, God? He was like, I want you to fast the gym for a week. I was like, a week, a week, a week. But then it was weird because for the first time in my life, I was like, I don't want to argue anymore. I'm tired of this. I am tired of this. Okay, guys, I didn't go to the gym all week and I'm still alive. And I'm feeling better. <laughs> Imagine that. When you stop, you get better? I, I didn't even know this was a thing. <laughs> See, I had put working out above God. And I don't think God is telling me I can't go back. Actually, I feel released to go tomorrow. I'm still praying about it, so pray for me. But I don't think that God is going to just ha take it completely away. But I had to get to a point. Now, I want you to hear this. I had to get to a point to where if he did completely take it away, I was at peace. What is that one thing in your life? I want you to think about it for a minute. We just, I just want to sit here for a minute because I think that's how we can tell if we've made it a God in our life, if we put it above God in our life, is if we can't honestly, and this isn't, this isn't between you and anyone but God, if we can't honestly say that we would be okay if we were to never have that thing again, if we were to be at peace, if we were to never have that thing again, I think it's something that we need to be willing to seek God on, ask him for grace to let us let go of that thing. What is it? Why don't you guys all stand, worship team, you want to come up here? I know all of you guys can't relate to the working out thing. But there's so many things that we can make this, right? I mean, I could just sit here and list out. This can be a spouse. This can be your kids. Your kids. Did you hear that? This can be your kids. Now, I'm not saying go and leave your kids somewhere. Please don't do, don't leave them down there with Joni. You're like, well, Carrie said. I'm like, no. <laughs> I struggled with letting go of my olders. I've got three olders and three littles. <laughs> my olders are now all out. And I, and, and I struggled letting go, because as a parent, you just want to like, you know, hold on to them. I let go, and one's in Washington, one's in California, and one's in Texas. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's okay. I still got David. Remember, I made an agreement. He's going to live in the basement until he's 40. <laughs> yeah, we're good. My point is, is that I think sometimes it's, it's easy to do with kids. I've seen it where parents are just like making their kids feel guilty for not staying there or not doing what they want. You know, it's easy to do. I get that. But like, we have to be willing to let go of them, right? We have to be willing to let go of our spouses. Nathan struggled with addiction for a while. And until I let go of that, and he's okay with me talking about it, until I let go of that, there really weren't any changes because God was trying to teach me that I was trying to control him and change him. I am not God. Who am I to go on and hold on to these people in my life and try to manipulate and control them? What is it that you're holding on to? What is it that you're not letting go of? This is hard today, but you know what? The truth will... Exactly. 
And that's what God is trying to bring us to, is the truth. It's time to face some things in our life. And it's okay, there's no condemnation. God loves you, he grieves with you. He wants relationship with you, but it's time to face the truth. It's time to look at it. What is God in your life? Is it God or is it something else? Everyone close your eyes. I'm going to pray. So Father, we thank you, God. We thank you that you are God, that you are Lord of our lives, God. Even though sometimes, God, we let other things get in the way, we put other things in front of you, on top of you, God, we ask that you reveal those things to us, God. Father, show us the truth, God, so that we can bring it back to you, God, and know that you will be faithful in teaching us and training in that, God. We want to follow our rabbi closely behind, God, to become more like him, God. Father, we are open to your teachings. We are open. And God, I just pray for every person in this place, God, that you begin to reveal things in their lives that they've held on to, God, that they've not let go of, God, that they've tried to make gods in their life, that they tried to control whether it be pain, whether it be suffering, whether it be a person or a thing, a job, a career, a ministry, a spouse, a child, whatever it is, God, begin to reveal to the sanctuary church what it is that they are looking to instead of you, God. And, and Father, I just thank you, God, that we do not have to stand in condemnation because there is no condemnation in Christ. But God, that you're going to come in and you're going to begin to show us your faithfulness and your goodness to be able to walk us out of these things, God out of relying on these things, just like you asked the disciples, God, to leave everything, God. Father, help us to leave everything. Help our heart to turn towards you and not to stuff or people or places or ministries or careers or spouses or children. God, help our hearts to be so focused on you, God. Father, we thank you, God. We thank you, God, for the testimonies. We thank you, God, for the stories about your grace in our lives, God. The redemptive power of your son, Jesus Christ, God. Mm. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we close, as this song is playing, I just want to open up the front here. And we don't need prayer team. You guys can pray from the pews. Just lay down, guys. I, I'm here with you. Like, I just did this, like, last week. It's okay. There's no condemnation. Don't let the enemy make you feel bad. It's stupid. He's stupid. Just come up here and just give it to God. Just start there. Okay? Bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thanks for tuning in to a message from the Sanctuary Church. For more information and media, go to our website at thesanctuarywestside.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube.